Okay, lovely students. This is the chapter on outcome identification and planning. Here are the learning objectives for this chapter. Please take a moment to review each one of these, review the key terms at the beginning of the chapter, and do NCLEX questions and rationales at the end. During the planning phase of the nursing process, the nurse works with the patient, other healthcare team members, and the family to figure out what problems are priority, um, identify what outcomes or goals the patient wants to achieve and document those, select cor uh, correct evidence-based practice nursing interventions, and communicate the plan of care with the patient, family, and every other healthcare member, team member, right? The planning phase is where a goal or outcome is developed and is a key part of the nursing process, right? Add pie. What do you want the patient to look like? Or what do you want the patient to be able to perform or be able to state when you are done with the interventions? The formulation of a formal plan of care allows for all of these things to happen, right? This includes providing individualized care to promote the best possible patient outcome. This helps sets the priorities for our patients, right, and their care. Um, it facilitates communication and it coordinates, um, you know, among nursing staff and other healthcare team members to be on the same page as far as the patient's plan of care. Um, therefore, it provides continuity of patient care, right, and promotes safe, effective patient care, right? Um, it creates a record for evaluation for reimbursement and legal purposes. Remember what I told you, Medicare reimburses most of um, you know, the organizations, you know, hospitals and hospice agencies and home health and, um, you know, SNFs and ALFs and those kinds of things. About 90% of, of our income comes from the federal government. Well, guess what? You have to have very thorough documentation and evaluation um, recorded appropriately or Medicare will deny and we won't get paid, right? And if you don't get paid and you keep providing services, eventually you go broke. So it's very important for reimbursement purposes. And guess what? That is a responsibility as a nurse to ensure that we are managing finances for the companies we're working for, right? And just in general, with, with medical in general, we need to be good stewards of, of our, our field, right, in our practice. Um, and it also promotes the nursing profession and development, right? So that's another reason we formulate this plan of care as thoroughly and as detailed as we do, right? Um, in, in um, let's see, informal planning can also occur on a daily basis as nurses observe the slight changes that occur in our patients, right? Or maybe it's just slight changes in their desires or needs, right? So we're, we're doing informal planning all the time. We also use clinical reason in this step of the nursing process. Um, those competencies are listed on this side. So please, I want you to pause the video and read through them um, so that you're aware of, you know, why, right? The clinical reasoning behind it. We also have to follow the law. So look to look into the national practice uh, standards, um, possibly consulting other professional associations. We are going to follow the Joint Commission standards for sure. Um, we're possibly going to refer other agencies for healthcare research for further guidance um, and refer to agencies, policies, and procedures that you're working at, right? We have to practice within all of these things. So again, pause the video, take a peek at it. Um, we're going to delve a lot deeper into each of these. I have included the links though so that you have them and you know where to go back to to access them. The purpose of creating a goal or outcome in a nursing plan of care is listed on this side. We must also adhere to some standards of care while developing an outcome or goal um, and while we're planning the patient's care, right? We must involve the patient and the family um, if, if the patient gives us approval. We need to be culturally aware. We need to consider the risks, the benefits, the costs of the selected outcome that we are potentially thinking about. Um, there's there also must be a time frame um, identified to be achieved with these goals. And we're going to delve deeper into setting a setting up short term and long term goals, right? Um, so that by that time frame, they either achieve it 
uh, partially achieve it or don't achieve it and we need to modify the goal as changes occur with the patient situation, right? Um, and of course, all of this is documented thoroughly in the goal. In planning, we look at the patient as a unique individual and pay attention to their values, their priorities, their preferences, all of that, right? It's going to be a, P, a big component of it. It's a big piece. Um, we look to promote or restore health. We may look to prevent injury, right? We're looking to alleviate any suffering that they have and be supportive of the patient, right? I am of the firm belief that your patient should not be in pain um, when it comes to suffering. It's just, it's we need to get ahead of it, right? Stay ahead of the pain. And so managing that effectively is our job, right? Um, it does need to be implemented in a timely manner, and we need to integrate science and evidence-based practice in the selection process. We should be utilizing the plan to direct care um, to other healthcare, you know, team members, and we also need to follow all the rules, regulations, and policies that have been given to us to help us modify the plan of care as necessary as we document, you know, all of the new assessment data that's coming through, right? And then, of course, use the standardized language um, that has been pre presented to you and you will learn in block one, the medical language so that, you know, the communication is effective and that the health, other health care team members recognize it. Um, there are also some questions you can ask yourself as you go through outcome identification and planning. First, you have to figure out which problems require your attention, right? Your immediate attention, and that's the prioritization comes in handy. And which one should you defer to another team member, right? <clears throat> so knowing what's within your scope, as well as the scopes of all the other um, team members you're going to be working for, that's why you need to know that. So you know, okay, my patient needs A, B, and C. Well, a, a and B are, is my responsibilities as a nurse, but C has to go through PT, right? So you're going to reach out to all the other individual healthcare team members that will help implement, um, you know, those interventions. And um, what must the patient look like or be able to perform or verbalize so that I know the problem has been resolved, right? So that's what we're asking ourselves. What do experts or research have to say about the benefits of this particular intervention that I'm thinking about doing, right? That's very, very um, appropriate and definitely relevant. What is the worst thing that can happen? And what can I do to minimize that possibility, right? Very, very key. Let's see, am I clear enough in my writing? completely important. Can anyone read the plan of care knowing how to intervene for this patient, right? Do I have it set up the right way? Can they read it? Does it make sense? So that if they needed to step in and, and care for the patient, they can do so with the right information. These are some of the questions you need to ask yourself as you go along your day, right? Um, the graph on this slide shows the questions you can ask yourself to determine if you can act independently or do I need help with my patient's plan of care, right? Do I need a, a dependent intervention, right? Do I need a medication? So I need to get in touch with my doctor and get that order. So I'm dependent on that interaction to be able to do that, right? We cannot write orders within our scope as our ends. So again, take a moment, pause the video and look through these questions and determinations. It will really help um, narrow your scope. Initial planning is done by the nurse um, completing the admission interview and physical assessment. Standardized care plans have been developed to be an assistive tool for us as nurses. But please remember, you still need to individualize these care plans. These are usually um, computer generated um, at the hospitals, in the SNFs and ALFs, home health, hospice, all of them. And they get adopted by the agency you're working for, right? But again, you take those outlines and then you literally will map it to your current patient. So you're going to make it more individualized. Ongoing planning, <clears throat> excuse me, ongoing planning is carried out by the, any nurse caring for that patient. This keeps the plan of care current and relevant. And you may need to clarify some diagnoses, you may need to add new ones in, you may need to adjust outcomes, you may identify new and additional nursing interventions that are needed, right? This is a continually ongoing process. Discharge planning, again, begins on day one. We have to start thinking on day one with this patient what the patient's health and psychosocial status needs to look like at the end time at discharge and what will they need after they leave our agency, you know, to continue to heal and recover. 
Um, initial planning is developed by the nurse who performs the nursing history and physical assessment and that addresses each problem listed in the prioritized problem list <clears throat> and identifies appropriate patient goals and, re and related nursing care, right? Um, ongoing plan is carried out by any nurse who interacts with the patient. Ongoing planning keeps the plan up to date, helps manage, manage risk factors, it helps promote function. The outcomes planning helps problem statements be more clearly, um, helps develop new, new problem statements, and helps make outcomes more realistic, right? Um, and helps identify nursing interventions that will help accomplish the patient to reach these goals. Discharge planning is carried out by the nurse who works most closely with the patient. Discharge planning begins again on day one of admission to the facility. Discharge planning is crucial to ensure that the teaching and education we do for our patients and families are effective, thus ensuring that the patient uh, Home care is performed competently by the patient and family. Also ensuring if, you know, that it's thorough and competent so that they don't bounce back to the hospital. Um, and Medicare is actually now in some cases not reimbursing for bounce back patients from discharged hospitals when it was due to the fact that the nurse didn't spend enough, enough time educating the patient or the doctor didn't spend enough time doing pieces of theirs. So you got to really spend the time doing, um, what is expected in this role because there are penalties for that, right? And us not getting reimbursed is just one of many. Nursing diagnoses is a clinical judgment about individual, family, or community responses to actual or potential health problems or life processes. Creating a nursing diagnosis, again, is a critical part of providing patient care, and it's a vital step um, in the nursing process, right? To best understand a nursing diagnosis, it, it may help to first understand how it differs from a medical diagnosis. So we're going to delve in a little bit deeper now. Again, a nursing diagnosis is initiated by a nurse and describes a response to the medical diagnosis. So the medical diagnosis is given by the doctor um, or nurse practitioner or PA to a patient to define a medical condition or disease, right, or injury. So for one example, one medical diagnosis might be asthma and the nursing diagnosis, again, that focuses on the individual and how that affects them, right? In addition to what's occurring due to the medical diagnosis. Um, so for asthma, we would have a nursing diagnosis of ineffective breathing pattern related to impaired inhalation and exhalation as evidenced by using accessory muscles to breathe. Right? So you can see the big difference between those two. By understanding how to create a nursing diagnosis, you can help improve patient outcomes, improve communication among all of the healthcare team members, and organize your day in a manner where you are able to stay ahead of the game and therefore provide better patient care and improve patient outcomes. Both the nursing process and nursing diagnoses help ensure and promote evidence based practice, best safe practices. First part of the nursing diagnosis is the actual statement about the um, actual problem or a potential health problem of the patient that can be managed through in independent nursing interventions. Etiology or related factors describe the possible reasons for the problem or the condition in which um, it develops. These related factors guides the appropriate nursing interventions. So again, nursing uh, diagnoses versus medical diagnoses. I know I've talked about this a lot, but it's a process, right? And you will hear us repeat information. You know why? Because it takes up to eight to 11 times to hear something before you really do store it in your long-term memory, right? And this is everything we're teaching you in nursing school, you know, has to be remembered. So, um, so it's a lot of information. So the only way to get it in your permanent memory is to continually discuss it. So nursing diagnoses, again, is based on the patient's immediate situation. Um, it's initiated to resolve a health problem. It does improve your the communication among all the healthcare team members. And primarily, it's that holistic approach to caring for your patients. 
Whereas medical diagnosis is initiated by a medical doctor or a specialist, defines the medical condition, disease, or injury, and explains the signs and symptoms that go directly along with that disease or injury, right? Okay, so prioritizing, um, establishing priorities, right? Here we go. This is so critically important. So we start with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? So let's just say we're going to start with, we have Maslow's hierarchy of needs, patient preferences, anticipation of potential future problems, and then, of course, two of our threshold concepts, critically thinking and clinical reasoning in nursing, right? Key components of what we do as a nurse, right? Helps us, all of these things help us to establish our priorities and to put them in order of uh, importance, right? So again, one, identifying potential diagnoses, right? Is that step one. And then once the health problem or human response to the health problem has been identified, nurses are then asked, um, nurses then ask another question. So what's important information? Um, what is relevant to the health problem? Um, what is unrelated to the health problem, right? So that we, we can focus on the ones that are related and get rid of the ones that are unrelated to what's going on, right? Because there's going to be a lot of erroneous information that isn't relevant. And it takes time to figure out what is relevant and what isn't, right? It's not something that you just walk in and immediately have, you know, the answer, right? Um, so the, an the answer to the question helps create a potential nursing diagnosis, right? Nurses will then determine the category of the nursing diagnoses. Um, we will then either confirm or rule out other diagnoses. Next step after that is creating the new diagnoses. And the nursing diagnoses, uh, diagnoses I can speak today, yes. <laughs> uh, it must be validated and critically thought through, right? So again, we're using NANDA. Um, and uh, they advise using an in-depth assessment, which of course we're going to do, um, because it'll help rule in or rule out a di your nursing diagnoses, right? Then, so um, also Nanda recommends structuring your nursing diagnoses in related to factors, as well as defining characteristics as we have previously talked about. Um, by doing this, we can highlight the strength and accuracy of that nursing diagnosis. That's why we do it, okay? Um, and then next would be implementing that plan of care, that nursing plan of care. Um, so again, a nursing diagnosis determines the care plan. Um, we create very measurable, achievable goals. Doesn't make any sense to create a goal that's not achievable. So remember, take your patient's current situation and all the related factors into consideration when coming up with that right, um, that plan of care, because it has to be measurable and achievable. Um, and then we take action, right? So we're putting the plan into play and then administering the plan interventions. Okay, prioritizing nursing diagnoses. Holy smokes, we're going to be doing a lot of this, right? Because as I've mentioned numerous times, you are continually prioritizing and reprioritizing your patients to know exactly who is most urgent and needs your attention now, right? So we need to prioritize our nursing diagnoses and direct our nursing care to address the most life-threatening problems first. So I always say, what's going to kill you quickest, right? What's going to kill you quickest? As long as it's as long as the example in the answers on your test or on NCLEX are related to what the question is asking you, and, you're, and it's about prioritization. Who are you going to see first? What is going to kill you quickest will be the right answer, right? So airway, breathing, circulation in that order. And then Maslow's, you can see it right here, right? Physiological needs, safety needs. And then it goes up to love and belonging. So you start at the base need after um, ABCs. So air, food, shelter, sleep, clothing, all of that would be priority over whether you have a job or not, right? <laughs> um, or whether you have the extra resources to buy your kids um, school clothes, right? School's School clothes are great and they're needed, don't get me wrong, but do you think you're worried about school, school clothes if you don't have a safe place for you and your kids to lay their heads down at night um, without the risk of being violated and robbed and beaten and killed, those kinds of things, right? That That's why these layers um, teach you to prioritize your patient's care, right? It's very, very important. Um, 
So when you, um, you're, again, you must first address the bottom pyramid. Um, so this includes the ability to breathe, take in water, sleep, have shelter. Um, again, if your patient's not able to breathe, um, it doesn't do any good to focus on constipation, <laughs> um, you know, those kinds of things. Um, next important is safety needs. So um, after that, it's love and belonging, then self-esteem, and then finding self-actualization. And I do want to tell you that you move up and down this, um, these Maslow hierarchy of needs throughout your life. It's not like you transition throughout your life and then when you get to 80 or 70, you're fi you finally at self-actualization. That's not, that's not it at all. You can get to self-actualization earlier, much, much earlier in your life, right? If all of these other areas have been met, you just continue to transition and thrive in life. But let's say you're up here on, uh, you know, self-esteem and, and you get recognition in your job and you're a leader among like, okay, for example, like, like our nursing program here at MCC, we got invited to go speak at, um, at the IWAC conference, the international writing across the curriculum conference in, um, at Clemson in South Carolina this summer, um, which is a huge honor, right? So, so I probably would be, um, you know, clearly I'm fulfilled here at, at esteem or self-actualization, but I guarantee you when my husband dies, I'm going to be dropping way back down here, right? I'm going to go right back down here to love and belonging. Or let's say you lose your job, then you go all the right back down here, right? You lose your job, safety needs, you don't have a job, right? Now, you may even drop further if you lose your job because then you may at some point when your savings runs out, you may not be able to have money for food or shelter or any, any of those things. Or you may be like there a lot of us who don't have a lot, of, a lot of savings or any at all. And you might drop all the way down here, right? Because now you don't have money for food. So does that make sense? That should make sense. And we are going to do lots of fun activities in class. Um, where we give you like 15 patient uh, scenarios and you got to prioritize them, right? Because that's how your test questions, again, are going to be. Whether it's our tests, you know, block two, three, and four tests or NCLEX, it's all going to be based on patient situations, right? Okay. Um, again, remember, we always have to consider patient preferences when we're planning their care. So we are going to use this guide, but patient preferences are going to be at the top because it's their care. So obviously, we're only going to do it if they're in agreement with it, right? And then also, we need to anticipate any future problems that could occur, right? Remember, then an individual will go up and down the hierarchy of needs um, throughout their life. Um, and Maslow's really is key to being a great nurse. So you will want to spend time as a student learning and understanding this information. And again, start putting in it in patient situations. Create your own. Honestly, the students who do the best are the ones who jump in with both feet, trust the process, and um, do everything, you know, that we're advising you, right? That we've learned through all of the education that we've gotten, right? Many of us, um, many of the instructors here have their PhD. All of us have at least a master's. And if all of us, if not all, have done additional seminars and uh, classes to figure out the best educational um, activities and interactions and case studies and all of these things that will help you get to the goal of becoming a nurse, right? So please trust the process um, and learn, spend time learning this information. Clinical reasoning is also used when establishing priorities. Consider these questions listed on this slide to incorporate clinical reasoning in your priority decision making. So please pause the video now and read through all of them, okay? Your goal or outcome is derived from the problem statement. Basically, your goal should be to eliminate the problem, right? Seems pretty straightforward. You only need to select one goal or problem. The Nursing Outcomes Classification, or NIC, Nursing Outcomes Classification, presents these goals in some standardized language. So this is a um, good initial guide to use, but please remember, your outcome should be very specific to your patient. Um, so it's a great guide to use though. 
Also remember our original example of our nursing diagnoses, acute pain related to right knee surgery as evidenced by, uh, as evidenced by the patient stating a pain level of seven out of 10. Well, let's go back to Living Con Advisor and go back to your nursing diagnoses tab. And you're gonna select acute pain again, and you're gonna look at the possible outcomes they have listed there. These are vague without measurable specifics or time frames, but it's a great starting point that you can adjust and add those pieces that are missing, right? Look at the ones that state the patient will experience comfort from a reduction in the level of pain or relief from pain. A more specific goal for our patient might be that the patient will report a pain of less than or equal to 2 out of 10 by the end of shift, right? And where do we get the 2 out of 10? You just ask your patient, right? It's their goals. What do you, what is an acceptable, what is an acceptable pain level for you? If you rank it on a scale of 0, no pain, to 10, the worst pain you feel in your life, where are you and what is acceptable to you, right? Those kinds of things. Um, this fits all the criteria a good statement needs to have. Um, it is patient specific, measurable, attainable, it's realistic, and it has a time frame on it, right? I want to do it by the end of my sh uh, shift. Outcomes can be either long term or they can be short term, right? So we can have long term and short term goals. You'll, have, you'll actually have both. Long term goals are usually done by discharge. So you'll have, you know, you want the, your patient to accomplish this by discharge, right? And then short term goals are usually within your shift, right? Um, uh, that's in the hospital, but maybe in the doctor's office, you may have a long-term goal of by the next office visit, you will have done this, right? Um, so uh, short-term goals, though, are usually given in a time frame that uh, by a certain hour, like an end of your shift or by this date, right? Um, and it's obviously much shorter time frame. Our goal from the previous example has a short-term goal because we want the patient's pain to be controlled in a relatively short time, right, by the end of this shift. Um, so that is um, why I chose end of shift as opposed by discharge, right? It's not That's not realistic. Your patient's pain should be managed by your shift. Um, and so your text has some good examples of both long-term and short-term goals. Um, I highly recommend that you pause the video now and go review those. The best way to start out in goal formation is to ask the patient what they would like to achieve or resolve while they're at the facility or the agency or the hospital, right, by their next visit. So please, um, next consider the patient's health status, right, and their prognoses um, so as not to set the goal too high. You want to make sure that they're not being unrealistic with their goals, right? So uh, consider the health status and prognosis and see if they match up. Next, have an idea of how long the patient has to achieve that goal um, where we're at, right? So how long are they possibly going to be in the hospital? Um, or if they're in an outpatient setting, what does that look like? So that you can appropriately set those goals. And then also know what your patient values and what they prefer along with their cultural practices, right? This is all a component of it. If it isn't something um, they value and it's, sometime, um, it's sometimes that goes against their cultural beliefs, then the goal will not be obtained, right? So it's important that we know that. Like, you know, if a doctor has a goal of something that is forbidden in a culture, then clearly the patient's not going to go along with it. Then why would you list it as one of their goals, right? That makes sense, right? It's got to be patient-centered outcomes, right? Um, what other healthcare providers are involved in this patient's care, right? You're going to look at that. Um, you're going to look at, will this goal help, um, will it help or hinder the interventions, right? You're going to look at that. Do the patient, does the patient have the resources available to help achieve this goal? That's a big component, right? Sometimes we'll give, you know, a patient, um, Eloquous or something and they won't have insurance and that it's expensive, right? They're not going to take it, right? So it's not realistic. You got to come back with something that's realistic. Otherwise, they're just going to leave, not tell you, not take the med and then end right back up in the hospital with, with uh, complications, right? Um, obviously, we're going to be looking at evidence-based practice all the time. What does research say and are there any risks with this goal, right? 
because you got to educate your patient about all of it, the risks, the benefits, all of it. And you also need to consider the patient's involvement, right? Um, if they're not willing to put forth an effort again to achieve that goal, then really you should not be listing it as your goal. The Institute of Medicine or IOM has six aims that should be considered when planning and designing your care of plan for your patient. These are listed here on the slide. Please take a moment and read through them and familiarize yourself with them. Outcomes can be categorized by the change that's needed in our patients. So do you need them to learn about their disease process, their treatment? Do you need them to learn about their medicines or their response to stressors? Um, that would be an, a cognitive outcome, right? Psychomotor outcomes describes a patient performing a new skill, right? Um, can they do this uh, detailed wound dressing change, right? Those kinds of things. Affective outcomes describe changes in a patient's values or their beliefs or their attitudes, right? Um, and I put some examples on this slide for you all. So this is a really important slide. Please pause, take a moment, write down notes, um, and see how they differ, right? Recognize how they differ. Please remember your outcomes should make sense for your patient and their current state of health um, and condition. Categories of outcomes. So we have cognitive describes increases in patients' knowledge or their intellectual behaviors. Psychomotor describes patients' achievement of a new skill. Affective describes uh, changes in a patient's beliefs, values, and attitudes. So here are some examples. Pause the video and read through them. You may want to take some notes. Those are really good examples. Um, here's another way of categorizing outcomes. Again, please pause the video and take a look. Your outcome statement has to have certain parts to it. It usually starts with the patient, <clears throat> excuse me, it usually starts with the patient or some part of the patient. Um, next, it has a verb to indicate the action that you're you, you want to see take place. And your book lists about 12 different action verbs you can use. So please go there, um, take a moment to review them, write them down, note them. Um, next, you, you may possibly have the condition or circumstances in which the outcome is to be achieved, uh, but this is not always needed. Uh, performance criteria, criteria describes what you can measure by observing, listening, or even actually measuring, right? Uh, your target time is when you expect the patient, when you expect the patient to achieve that outcome or goal, right? So that's your target time. And then again, gosh, make it, make sure it's realistic and make sure it's achievable by your patient or it's, you're just wasting your time, right? And making it worse because it's gonna exacerbate their problem. So you're just making it worse. <laughs> Okay, okay, I cannot stress enough how important this slide is, okay? You need to make sure all of your outcomes are measure, have SMART goals, okay? So all of your goals are SMART. They're specific, meaning um, what, a, what does the patient want to, want to achieve, right? What, what, are we, what are we doing here? What, are we, what is our goal, right? Measurable. Um, how will you know when you've reached it? How will we know that they actually reached that goal? Like it's measurable, right? Um, it's attainable, right? Is it really within the power to accomplish this goal? Because it has to be you know, it has to be within our power and the patient's power for them to reach that goal, right? Or it, it's worthless or useless, right? Realistic, right? Can they realistically achieve it? Like I have a patient one time who, who, um, you know, um, post-op in a ton of pain, you know, and, and their goal was to have no pain, right? <laughs> and, um, immediately following, um, you know, post-op, well, for a short time following post-op, you still have anesthesia on board and that does cover your pain for a while, right? That's what happens, actually. Patients come up and then they're feeling good, right? Because the anesthesia and the meds that they gave them in the OR are still, uh, you know, the pain meds they gave them in the OR are still affecting them, right? So they're feeling good. And, um, but then they, but every medication has a half-life, right? How long does it take for half of that dose to get out of your body? So before, before you know it, it's out of the body, right? Um, and 
the pain comes on with a it's like a vengeance and it's it's so intense so their goal of having zero pain in that situation would not be realistic right but getting them down to something manageable like a two or a three or even a four you know is realistic right and then of course um as the patient progresses then we could get down to to their goal of of you know you know, a realistic goal of, you know, one to two or whatever it is. And sometimes even zero, but just make sure that it's realistic. I'm sorry, I'm on a soapbox today. <laughs> Finally, uh, the last piece is timely. So you need to have a time frame on there. If there's no time frame, then again, the goal is, is um, useless because we're not coming back and checking to see did they obtain that goal, right? So exactly what, uh, when do you need to accomplish this by? Or more precisely, when do you want to accomplish this by? When you're first starting out writing goals for your patients, you can sometimes get those mixed up with the interventions. We see this happen a lot. So remember, the interventions are what you or the healthcare team are going to do, and the goals are what the patient will do. Okay, so again, let me say that again. The interventions are what we as the healthcare team members are going to do, but the goals are what the patient's going to do. So make sure not to use words like improve, get better, faster, slower, less, more, increase, decrease. These are not measurable. <laughs> They're too vague, right? So do not use those words. Write these down. Write them down. Do not use them. Remember, you only need one goal per nursing diagnosis. So don't put two goals in a goal statement. Don't put five. I've seen ten. Like, yeah. So, um, the Institute of Medicine 6 aims to be met by all the healthcare systems regarding our patient's quality of care. Um, so we see these, you know, in the QSIN initiatives, right, um, which we're going to discuss in our QSIN chapter, very, very critically important. Um, they're, they're created to provide safe care, the safest care for our patients, right? So pause the video. You need to write these down. You need to be aware of them. You need to be able to recall them, right? Because you will be tested on them. Um, again, Joint Commission National Patient Safety Goals, right? Huge. You definitely will be tested on the Joint Commission's uh, National uh, Patient Safety Goals. I think it's on your first exam. Um, possibly other exams in block one. It'll definitely be on your block one HESI exam. Um, it'll be on your final exam, possibly. Um, and then throughout all of nursing school and, and then again on NCLEX, it's so, so hugely important. So I really, really need you to pause and take a moment, read through them, make notes, um, make ample notes so that you are thoroughly um, ready for, um, not only for your exams, but just to, in, to implement it in your plan of your nursing care, right? Types of nursing interventions. Okay, nurse initiated or independent interventions are actions that because we hold a license, a nursing license, and thus we have the knowledge and skills able to care for our patients doing these things, we are able to perform them without having a doctor's order. Yes, I said that right. There are things we can do as a nurse because we've been trained and educated on it that we do not need a doctor's order for, right? Um, and I have examples of these on the screen. They're usually done to monitor the patient's health or to monitor the response to treatments um, or maybe even to reduce risks, resolve, prevent, or manage a problem. Maybe it's to promote patient independence, um, to promote optimal well-being. Um, maybe it's to inform your patients so they can make informed decisions. It's, it's a ton of these, right? Uh, but by gathering all the correct data on your patient, this will help direct you in the interventions that you're going to select. You can also refer to the nursing intervention classification list, and we'll be pulling this up in lab when we're working through coming up with the uh, nursing diagnoses. Um, because the nursing interventions classification list will help direct you into the possible nursing interventions, right? So this has already been created, a whole list of nursing interventions based on um, their classification. So please don't make it harder than it already is because it is complex, but use the tools that are already out there created for you um, to, you know, to streamline that process basically, right? And make it more accurate. 
nursing interventions are based on research of our best latest evidence-based practice and patient outcomes. There should be a specific rationale behind every single intervention we do. If there isn't, then we shouldn't be doing it. Physician or prescribers, they also initiate interventions um, and they also collaborate, right? And they are, um, they also have dependent interventions. Uh, sorry, physicians have prescriber initiated interventions and collaborative interventions. Uh, but, in, but in addition to our nursing independent um, interventions, we as nurses also have what we call dependent interventions. So these are the ones that nurses will need in order to perform, right? We can't do them by ourselves, right? Okay, this patient's in pain. They don't have a current order for pain medication. So I got to get in touch with a doctor because I don't have a DEA license to prescribe pain meds, right? And even if it's, you know, Tylenol, you still need an order for it, right? You don't need a DEA license for that, but you definitely need a, a doctor's order, right? It's not in our scope to prescribe. So that would be um, an example of a dependent nursing, uh, intervent, uh, dependent nursing intervention. Um, it could also be treatments, right? Uh, any type of treatments with your patient or even simply as applying hot or cold um, administration to your patient, right? All of these things need nurses orders. So they uh, need doctor orders, sorry. So they are dependent nursing interventions. You're gonna be tested on that. So make sure you know it. Um, this can also be prescribed by professionals like speech therapists or PT, OT, right? Occupational physical therapists. Um, let's go back to Lipping Hot Advisor. So go back to Lipping Hot Advisor under nursing diagnoses, and we're going to pick up, uh, pull up acute pain again. Scroll down to the interventions. The independent ones listed there are nurse initiated. The collaborative ones there will require orders or expertise from another person or, an in, or instruction, right? Um, I do not want you to spend any time on the domains or leveling the nursing diagnoses right now. Um, our goal right now is to have you understand the care planning process. We're going to delve into that other pieces later on, right? And again, your text has some really good guidelines for selecting interventions. So please pause and take a moment and look through those. Guidelines for composing and recording interventions are listed on this slide. I want you to think of writing interventions like following a recipe to make a meal. You need to have enough details in the instructions so that it's performed correctly so that the patient can achieve the expected outcome. If you write in order to, for, per se, ambulate the patient, like that's it. <laughs> how far and with assist by themselves with what like you know it's too vague you need to be more specific like for example ambulate the patient with one person assist one to two times around the floor two to three times per shift you see how precise that is that's how they need to be right now the next nurse will now know exactly what's expected to be done right also refer to your textbook on the guidelines for well-written nursing interventions. And FYI, you are not responsible to know the structured care methodologies. For example, the four types of nursing care models like functional nursing, team nursing, primary nursing, and total patient care. So don't, wait, don't spend your time on that, okay? Nursing interventions involves monitoring our patient's health status, reducing risks, uh, resolving preventing, managing problems, promoting our patients, <clears throat> excuse me, promoting our patients' independence with their ADLs, promoting optimal sense of physical, psychological, spiritual well-being, um, giving patients the information needed so that they're able to make the best informed decisions about their care, right, and to help them be as independent as they possibly can be. 
Structured care methodologies are tools that provide a comprehensive approach to patient care delivery. These tools have evolved in their application and purpose over the years. In many situations, multiple tools are needed to obtain the best possible patient outcome, right? In today's healthcare environment, institutions are striving to streamline processes, reduce costs of healthcare, that's a big one, and establish best practice patterns while maintaining and improving the quality of care. Various healthcare delivery models are in use, um, including case management, um, outcomes management. There are structured care methodologies for almost every hospitalized system, right, that, inc that help incorporate different models to support cost reduction or streamlining processes that not only streamline the process, but help improve the quality of our patient's care and our patient's outcomes, right? Um, there are different types of nursing care um, you will be performing under these different type of care plans. Nursing care related to basic human needs, nursing care related to nursing diagnoses, and nursing care related to the medical plan of treatment, right? These are also different uh, formats. Um, uh, what I'm trying to say is there's also different type of care plan formats out there, right? We're going to recommend one that all the other blocks use, but honestly, um, there are hundreds. So uh, what, I, what we want to say is you want to pick one that speaks to you and makes the most sense to you and, and works best for you. So it's, we'll call that student-centered care, right? So whatever tools that make them make most sense to you, you definitely want to use those, right? Um, again, most of them are computer computer generated, um, which generally, which will definitely increase access, access to our healthcare team members, right? And again, it's like immediate access, no matter where they're at in the world, <laughs> they can access those records, thus reducing the amount of time in, um, that we spend on paperwork and doing a lot of you know, calls and figuring out all, all those things, right? Now you can just pull up your computer and have it right at your hands. It's so much nicer than it used to be back in the days of pagers, um, you know, uh, pay phones, those kind of weird things that we had to deal with. But still, you're still, but remember, you're still individualizing those plans of care. While, while it's much easier today, we're still having to individualize them for your patient, right? Um, there are concept map care plans, right? Um, there's an example of one in your te textbook. Again, we have one that we created in a, in a uh, we had a, an expert come out and speak to nursing care plans. And so we developed one with their help that all of us are using here at MCC. And it, it probably is one of the best ones that's out there. Um, so take a look at the one in your book, though, just so you can compare, right? Um, some agencies will use clinical pathways, um, or sometimes you'll hear them called critical pathways or care maps, right? So just be aware that those are out there. Um, some of them have like predetermined daily outcomes, predetermined daily interventions, like for non-complicated routine care patients, like, like a total knee replacement, for example. There are care sets that we do with every single one that comes through, right? And then we add to that what's individual to that specific patient, right? So um, there's a good example of a total knee replacement clinical pathway in your textbook. So please take a moment, pause, and take a look at that, right? Um, you will be doing a lot of comprehensive patient care plans as a student. This is to get your brain to start thinking like a nurse, right? There's a method to the madness. So both handwritten probably and, and on the computer, right? Because we're going to be doing them in lab and clinicals. We're going to be doing them in class. So by the time you're done with nursing school, it will roll right out of you like it was in your brain the entire time. So this is awesome, right? Um, so this is a good example of a complete student care plan with rationales for the interventions chosen and the evaluation in your textbook. So um, Go to your textbook. There's an example of that complete uh, student care plan in there. And that will help you when you're um, creating your own care plans, right? Also, what I want to say about there are really great nursing care plan books out there. And um, 
you don't even need to get the most up-to-date version. You could buy an outdated version and save a lot of money and get it for, you know, pretty reasonable. Um, so you might want to consider doing that or maybe buying one uh, for your study groups that so when you guys get together, you can practice, right, and use that. Uh, we will be going on to implementing and evaluating coming up in these next chapters. So I'm not going to go into detail on the benefits of using NIC and NOC language now. But if you're interested in that, feel free to read about it in your textbook. Um, do I want to say anything else? No, I think that's it. This is the end of the chapter on outcome, identification, and planning.